We're building an authentication solution using client credentials flow defined in the OAuth standard. It is for machine to machine communication. That means that with this flow there is no user involved, but don't switch off when you need a flow with users. This quick start is a great way to learn the basics of implementing flows with identity server, no matter which flow you end up using. And you will need the knowledge in the quick starts to come. I'm Roland Goud for the Wender Software, the company behind Identity Server. Here's what we're going to build. We will have a client, a console application, that needs to get data from an API that is protected. It requires an access token. So before it can do the request, it has to get that from the identity provider, an ASP.NET Core application using Identity Server. And in this case, we're using client credentials flow, and that means that the client will get the token in exchange for the client ID and secret that are configured at the identity provider. Once it has the token, the client can do the HTTP request to the API, putting the access token in an HTTP header. You'll find the finished solution in our samples GitHub repository here. And if you would like to see the steps in text after watching this, you can do so here. Ok, let's get started. First, we're creating an identity server project using the ISMT template. Please take a look at the video dedicated to templates to see how you can get started with these. Here I've put the project in a Visual Studio solution. The first thing we have to do is to define an API scope that represents the API we want to access. Config.cs contains the in-memory configuration for Identity Server. Add the API in the API scope array that is returned from the API scope's property getter. The name property of an API scope is the technical name, the name used in the OAuth flow. This is also the scope the clients need to request to get an access token for it. Display name is the friendly name, the name the user is going to see on consent screens, etc. We're not using it in the client credential solution because there is no user, but this API configuration can be used in multiple flows, also involving users. So in the future, this may become relevant. Of course, API 1 and My API aren't names you should use for a real application. Instead, give them useful names like Customer API. Next step is to define a client in the client's property. We're defining a client ID, again use a meaningful name in a real application, and we allow this client to use client credentials flow. And next we defined a secret which needs to be hashed. It acts like a password for a client. And of course secret is not a good secret. It's used just for demo purposes. Finally we have to allow this client to request the API scope we just configured. The API scopes and the clients in config.cs are added in the file hostingextensions.cs in the configure services method. And that's it. The identity provider is good to go. Let's run it and take a look at the discovery document. The discovery document is a standard endpoint in OpenID Connect and OAuth. Among other useful information, all needed endpoints are listed here. It's very useful because now clients and APIs can basically configure themselves. All we have to do is to point them to the URL of the identity provider. We'll see how that works in the next part, that is setting up the API. Add an empty ASP.NET Core project to the solution using your preferred way. And add the NuGet package Microsoft ASP.NET Core Authentication Jolt Bearer. Now in Program.cs call Add Authentication and on the object that is returned from that call, add Jolt Bearer, which takes a lambda with an options object. In case you're wondering, JWT or Jolt stands for JSON Web Token. JSON is the format of the token that is expected. The authority property has to point to the identity provider, and that's all that's needed. The rest of the configuration details are retrieved from the discovery document.
We're disabling audience validation in this case, because access to the API is modeled with API scopes only for now. By default, no audience will be emitted unless the API is modeled with API resources instead. Please take a look here for more information. Authorization also has to be enabled at this point. Now let's configure the API to listen on localhost port 6001. The last thing to do is to add an endpoint. Now this one returns the claims that are contained in the token. In ASP.NET Core the claims principle object is used to represent the user. And user doesn't have to be a human in this case. A client can also be the user of an API. Note that require authorization is added here. This will make sure this endpoint can only be accessed when a valid access token that came from our identity provider is presented. I'm using the minimal API framework here, but this will of course work just as well when using controllers. When we run the API and go to the identity endpoint, we get a 401 back as expected. It is now protected by identity server. Final step is to create the client that accesses the API. Add a console project to the solution and add the identity model NuGet package that will help us with the identity provider interaction. First we create an HTTP client to do the request and call the get discovery document async extension method on it to access the discovery document on our identity provider. The disco object now contains its contents. If anything goes wrong, there has to be a proper response. And now that we have the information from the discovery endpoint, the token can be requested using another extension method, which takes a client credentials token request that has to know the location of the token endpoint. And that is used to exchange the client credentials for the token. We can get the location from the disco object. The client ID and client secret are also configured here, as well as the API scope that needs to be requested. Let's guard for any errors again, after which the response object that is returned from the request client credentials token async call can be accessed to write the access token to the console. To call the API, we create a fresh HTTP client and use a set bearer token extension method to configure it to attach the access token as an HTTP header for the requests that follow. After that, the request can be done as normal to the identity endpoint. Again, we guard for errors, and the code that follows outputs the API response in a nicely formatted way. Now all three projects can be ran together, and make sure the identity provider and API are started first. And the output of the client, the console application, shows the access token and the claims in the token. One of them is the scope that was requested. Important to realize is that we don't do anything on the API side to validate this claim. The API at this point will accept any access token coming from our identity provider, which is probably not what we want. To change that, an ASP.NET Core authorization policy can be added, using the same pattern on add authorization we saw before. On the options object, Add policy can be called, defining a name for the policy and a lambda that defines the policy. We require an authenticated user, which in this context means that we need a valid access token because we only configured the job bearer handler. The second requirement is that we need a claim type scope, the value of which is the name of the API. To enforce this policy, its name can be passed as the first parameter to require authorization at the identity endpoint. So the API will now check if the scope claim is present with the correct value when the access point is accessed. And that completes this quick start. Hope it helps. See you in the next video.